You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shabas Prakash. This episode of Market Champions is brought to you by Simplify ETFs. For more information, visit simplify.us. No simplified funds will be discussed during this podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today, I've got John Champaglia. He's the CEO of Sprout based in Toronto. John, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's amazing to have you here. You know, we're going to have an awesome conversation around uranium, you know, metal commodities, et cetera. And so, you know, it's going to be awesome to get your thoughts um, on those matters. So, you know, thank you so much for being on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. So, you know, first off, you know, could you share a little bit about your background, you know, how you got into the business and, you know, what drove you towards commodities and, um, and and know your journey to joining Spot Asset Management and becoming their CEO. Sure. Yeah. Well, listen. I, like yourself, I got interested in in business and economics and finance in university, which uh, was a long time ago. Uh, but you know, I had uh, an early passion for it, so I, I'm very thankful that I found something that um, you enjoy doing, and you get paid you get paid doing something that you enjoy. So it doesn't always feel like work. Um, it's a it's a, a very dynamic industry. It's constantly changing. Um, capital markets are very dynamic. So um, I've been working in the investment area, I guess, since 1993, and um, it's really all I know. So it's it's been a great journey. Um, I've worked for a lot of really great asset management firms uh, over that period of time, and I learned a lot and worked with a lot of great people. And the last, uh, I guess, 11 years I've been with Sprott Asset Management. So, uh, which, which was really uh, a big pivot for me because I, uh, prior to joining Sprott, I did, I did not have a lot of exposure to uh, commodity markets and, uh, and, and precious metals markets and mining. And, and that's obviously what we focus on. So uh, that's where I spend most of my time is focusing on, on the precious metals and and more recently on the uranium market, uh, which has been a huge success for us. Um, so yeah, happy to, to talk about uh, about those markets today with you. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, you know, most people, when they think of Sprout, you know, you sort of become very well known for your uh, for your uranium product and your uranium trust. And so, you know, to start off, um, you know, in your, uh, you know, in your view, where are we in the commodity cycle? And, you know, especially mm-hmm. speaking, you know, where are we in the uranium cycle? Yeah, sure. Well, I would say on the commodity cycle, we're probably in about the second inning. Uh, and, I, and I feel that because you have to kind of take a, a step back and look at what's basically played out over the last 25 odd years. We had a commodity super cycle in the mid to late 2000s leading up to the, the great financial uh, crisis where you know all things commodity related uh, basically went straight up. And this was really re- related to massive infrastructure and urbanization in, in, in emerging markets like India and China and Brazil. Um, and that created insatiable demand for commodities as fundamental building blocks. And then we had the you know, financial crisis that really stopped you know, global growth in its tracks and led to uh, a big correction in commodities. Uh, we saw a little bit of an upturn in 2010 and 11, and then we went through a multi-year bear market for many commodities. And I can tell you that trying to speak to institutional investors two years ago or three years ago or four years ago about commodities was essentially a non-starter. I mean, there was so much negative halo on the on the on the sector that you'd basically be stopped in your tracks having in a, during a discussion with an institution. You know, they would just say, like, I don't want to talk about any of that stuff. I got burned in that area. I don't want to talk about it. I'm not interested in it. In it. You know, and that's b- because commodities were in a big, you know, trough 
Um, and a lot of other asset classes were doing really well. I mean, stocks generally were doing very well, tech stocks, there's lots of areas of, uh, of interest for investors globally. So what happens is you have a lot of capital destruction in these bear markets. Um, and you have a lot of capacity destruction. And I think this is what the world is now figuring out that unfortunately COVID and now more recently the you know, the war in Ukraine has really highlighted to the world how vulnerable all of our supply chains are and also how vulnerable we are in the commodity world to not just certain things, but to supply disruptions. And also the bigger picture, uh, uh, which is years of underinvestment uh, in neglect in a lot of these commodities. So everybody wants to have electric vehicles, everybody wants to have cleaner grids and decarbonization. Uh, and everybody wants economic progress. The reality is a lot of these things uh, need valuable raw materials, which are mined out of the earth. And uh, a lot of these, as I mentioned, a lot of these commodity sectors uh, have been shut in, uh, a lot of projects closed, curtailed. Uh, and then when you know the world needs these things because of a, a disruption, whether it was COVID or sanctions in Russia, they realize that there's just not a lot of material around. They're, they're, or they, you know, you run into supply squeezes and then the prices run away from you. So the world's obviously figured out that uh, these, these commodities are not uh, as readily available as, as they thought they were. Um, and I think on the energy side, the world has been so focused on decarbonization and energy transition away from fossil fuels the last year. And that's where, you know, the uranium story kind of comes into play here. But with the war in Ukraine and invasion by Russia, the world is quickly learning about energy security. Um, energy security is just as important as energy transition. Um, we learned back in the early 1970s what energy security was all about when the price of oil basically skyrocketed and, and OPEC basically squeezed the world for oil. That was by, you know, um, there, that was when the, the US and other uh, Western countries started to build out their nuclear power plants to, to, so that we would, they would not be as dependent on foreign oil as they, as they were. Um, so perhaps this uh, set of events that's unfolding right now in the world could act as a catalyst and influence energy policy going forward. And, and, and that policy is still going to be focused on energy transition because that's the bigger term, longer term goal. But uh, I think there's going to be greater consideration, obviously. Uh, placed on energy security and where you're getting your energy from. Um, obviously, people are are reevaluating everything right now. Got it, got it. And you know, you're already, uh, you know, as you mentioned, um, as part of the Russia-Ukraine situation, you're starting to see nuclear phase-outs being postponed in parts of Europe, and, and it's clearly because um, when you when you depend on an unstable supply like Russia, you start to see that. Uh, you start to see that you can't really depend on them because one in the situation of a war, you start to see prices go through the roof. And and again, you know, it's it's sort of like they, it's, it's sort of Russia's trump card because they supply energy to to the to the rest of Western Europe. And so therefore, you know, they can just say that, you know, if you don't do X, you know, we won't give you energy. So you know, because, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, we've you've you've seen just in the last few weeks, you've seen uh Prime Minister Johnson in in um in the UK say that he would like the UK to have 25% uh their energy uh produced by by nuclear so that would be a big big step change for them you've seen other com uh, other countries that had nuclear power plants on scheduled uh wind downs say no that's off the table we're extending their operating licenses for up to 10 years um you know Germany I think is the most vulnerable here because uh, at the beginning of this year, they closed three nuclear reactors and have three left in operation. And the last three are, are scheduled to close at the end of this year. And you might say, well, hold on a second. Why don't they just stop those plans, uh, turn, the, turn the other three back on and keep the, the current three operating. And uh, it's not so easy. Uh, th those reactors don't have any fuel. Uh, to continue or to restart in the short term. So, uh, you know, Germany is a, is a great example of, of, of being beholden to a regime that uh, for their energy 
And you know, the Nord Stream uh, 2 pipeline, uh, which is a pipeline going directly from Russia right to Germany uh, for natural gas, uh, which was supposed to be certified and, and, and uh, operating, is obviously in limbo right now. So um, it's a great example of a, of a country not balancing energy security with energy transition considerations. Yep, I agree. And you know, and moving on to just specifically the uranium market, you know, you know what does institutional demand look like? And you know, has institutional demand for uranium changed over the last few weeks? Yeah, um, I would say in 2022, we've seen a huge interest in, uh, in uranium um, for a number of factors. One, uh, in the beginning of the year in January, the, the social unrest that uh, we witnessed in Kazakhstan made people a little bit nervous about the uranium supply chain. Kazakhstan produces about 42% of all the uranium in the world. So when you have a country going through Social unrest that creates anxiety for long-term customers of uranium, which are utilities, where security of supply for a, a nuclear reactor is paramount. You can never run out of uranium and turn your, your reactor off. So I'd say that was the first catalyst as we came uh, into the new year. Obviously, uh, the second catalyst that we started to see was with uh, Russian-Ukraine invasion. That obviously caught the world off, off, uh, off guard. And that doesn't necessarily um, affect uranium in U308 form, but it, it, convert, it uh, impacts uh, the, element, the stages of uranium that are closer to the actual usage in a power plant. So that would be in the conversion market and the Richmond market. Um, that, that has utilities very concerned right now because they do rely on Russian enriched uh, uranium. Um, and then the last part that's really, I think, acted as a catalyst this year for the uranium market is the return of utilities back to the term contracting market. And just for some perspective, I think uh, the, the signal we got in the middle of February was the most pronounced from Cameco, where they told us that uh, at that point in February, they had contracted uh, to sell 40 million pounds of uranium to utility customers. And just to give you some perspective, in 2021, the entire calendar year, they had contracted 30 million pounds. So that was the signal we've been looking for around utilities, basically looking at the price move in, in, um, in uranium and saying, okay, we need to lock down price, we need to lock down supply. Um, and the way utilities buy uranium is very different than, than other utilities. If you're operating a natural gas plant, the natural gas is coming right to the plant. You don't have a big storage facility there. Um, you need real-time, you know, real-time inventory. It's just in time. Uranium is totally different. U uh, utilities are buying years in advance, and there's a long fabrication process in terms of taking, you know, U308 uh, in, in, in its form to then ultimately convert it and enrich it to what becomes a fuel pellet that goes into a reactor. So it's a much longer fuel cycle, um, and utilities will generally buy uranium out four years, five years, six years, all the way up to 10 years in time for delivery. So dynamic than other commodities, which will operate more real time. Yeah, 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 got it. And so, you know, on the topic of delivery, so when it comes to the Sprout Uranium Trust, you know, how far out are the deliveries that, you know, you're buying? And, you know, is there anything actually available for sub 45 day delivery? Sure. Yeah, so the trust basically um, has acquired close to 12 million pounds of U308 this year alone. So we've been pretty active in the marketplace. Generally, what we're doing is we're raising capital and then looking for the best available offers to buy uh, uranium and add it to the stockpile. We've generally focused on the shortest delivery windows possible. So the, those are generally sub 60 days. Um, and that's a way for us to minimize any kind of counterparty risk. And most of our deliveries are short-term in nature. There have been some occasions where we've had to stretch out a little bit um, in term for delivery because we were buying a larger quantity and it was either in transit or it took some time to, to get to our storage facilities. But generally we're buying short-term and with a few exceptions where we make a little five or six months. Yeah, yeah. And so, and also who is Spra actually buying from, you know, in the sense that, you know, who is actually crazy enough to sell right now, considering, you know, the whole 
one energy transition and the whole uranium thesis. So, you know, who like who are your counterparties and who are you buying from? Yeah, sure. Well, it's a great question. And, you know, we, we've purchased uranium from about 25 different counterparties so far. Um, and that's part of our strategy is to find the best available offers and to deal with as many parties as possible. So we're constantly looking for material that's available um, and try to get the best, the best uh, fills for the fund. Um, since the invasion of the, of the Ukraine by Russia, we've definitely sensed uh, greater uh, hesitancy around uh, different parties letting go of their material. Um, just with all the uncertainty going on right now and, and uh, people holding out for higher prices in, in, in case things uh, escalate and the supply chain gets further disrupted. So we've definitely noticed uh, people being a bit more apprehensive. But at the same time, you know, there is an incentive price for just about every, anybody out there um, to sell their pounds. And what we've noticed is as the price has gone up and people are re have realized um, uh, big gains with the pounds that they may be sitting on, they have a natural incentive to sell them in the marketplace. So, you know, at the beginning of 2022, we started at $42 a pound. Right now, we're just over $58 a pound. So, um, the move this year alone is acting as an incentive to make some pounds available to us. So um, we definitely are noticing the market getting a little tighter, a little bit uh, thinner, but uh, we've been able to kind of claw our way and, and find pounds so far this year. Got it, got it. And, and you know, on a similar note, you know, how much, how much available uranium is there? And so, you know, demand far outstrips supply and, you know, at its core, that's the investment thesis. But you now how much spot is actually available on any given day? Yeah, I wish, well, I wish I knew. I mean, it's, it's an opaque market. Um, so all we can do is basically survey different market participants and get a feel for how many pounds they have and what prices they'd be willing to sell them to us. So every day is a little different. Some days it's very quiet and there's really nothing available for, for sale. Um, other days we, we have multiple parties kind of reaching out to us, asking us whether we're interested in buying uranium from them. So it's, um, it's a very unique market. It's not a big market. It, it's, you know, nowhere near the, the size of other energy markets where, you know, tens of millions of barrels of oil are trading every day. Um, uranium is a very small market. Um, so, you know, you, you have to kind of, uh, feel your way through it. And, um, as I said, every day I find very different. Yeah, yeah. And you know, on the other uh, on the other hand, you know, what is the exit strategy for SPHA? And you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, how would uh, okay? Yeah, so, what is the exit strategy for it? And you know, how would uh, how would it you know wind up? You know, you, I guess logically speaking, you can't keep buying U three O eight forever. So, how uh, you know what is the exit strategy for SPHA? Yeah, we get that quite. We got that question a lot last year, um, <laughs> mainly from utilities. Actually, you got it from me as well. To figure out exactly, you know, how the trust was impacting the marketplace, and the, the answer is really simple. It's a perpetual trust, which means it goes on forever. Um, and you know, we run, we run four other uh, types of these funds. Um, they've been around since starting in 2010. Um, so it's a pretty simple structure. I mean, if we can raise capital on an accretive basis, we will do that. We will take the capital and, and buy more, more uranium or gold or silver or platinum and palladium across our funds. Um, and there's no real end game for it. The, the funds continue in perpetuity. We don't have any incentive to sell the material. Um, we don't loan out the material. We've never done that with any of our funds. So it's a, it's a very simple, it's a very simple vehicle. Um, so, you know, some people said, you know, well, if the price gets to $100, will you just like sell all the uranium and give everyone their money back? And no, that's, we don't have any financial incentive to do that. Um, we, we make money by managing the fund. And that means that, continue, you know, we, we only make a fee on it if it continues to operate. So that's, that's not how these vehicles um, work in the marketplace. Yeah. And also, you know, would holders of SBUT ever be able to get, you know, physical delivery if they have proper permits and other legal requirements to do so? And, you know, if not, you know, what are the guarantees that the trust unit price won't actually deviate from the price of U308, you know, substantially? Yeah, well, there's no guarantees about that. I mean, this is a closed-end fund. So on any given day, the, the balance of buyers and sellers 
uh, come to the market and they determine where they're willing to buy and sell shares. And sometimes those are, those are at prices that are at a premium to spot uranium and sometimes they're at a discount. Our goal is to try to do whatever we can to keep the market price uh, the fund is trading at and the net asset value within an acceptable range. Uh, we, you know, you don't have total control of it, but you basically do whatever you can to help it stay in a tight range. And we do that for all of our funds. Um, so it is, it is the nature of the, of the beast. Um, but, you know, we're, we've been happy with the way it's traded. It's generally traded around net asset value. Um, trying to even find a price for uranium and, and on, on uh, you know, from a reliable source is, is a big challenge in itself because, you know, it is a market that's driven by pricing reporters and the pricing reporters generally have paid subscription services to, to, to get that information. So I think a lot of investors are, are looking at the, the trust valuation that we put out every night and using that as a proxy price around, you know, where, where, where the market is, uh, believes the price of uranium is trading, uh, get, you know, day to day. Yeah, yeah, I see. Well, moving on, you know, are there any actual risks that say in a situation where the price of uranium goes too high or on the other hand, in the price of other, uh, price of fossil fuels goes too high and the mm -hmm. government sort of forced a transition to uranium. Do you think that there is a situation where you know, this broad could actually be forced to sell its uranium in the market, you know, through government regulation. Yeah, I don't think there's any risk of that. Um, you know, we 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 looked at the marketplace back in the last cycle, uh, where you know uranium in the spot market hit almost $140 a pound, which in 2007 terms uh, was enormous, right? When you think about it, today's inflation adjusted pricing. And at that time, there was no regulator body, uh, securities regulator, government agency, or anything of that sort that intervened in the market. I mean, the reality is, 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 is markets are free trading, whether it's oil, natural gas, wheat, sugar, whatever. Um, yes, there are times where exchanges uh, impose limits, or as we saw recently with an LME in the nickel market getting closed down temporarily. But you know, in terms of this idea of some government entity having the authority to come and seize assets that are held in a tr custody in a trust, uh, we don't see that unless you you live in some kind of dictator country. So um, we we don't think that's a real risk. Um, we don't want the trust to to be you know this giant uh, uh, secondary supply overhang in the marketplace. We we think that would be very negative for the shareholders. Yeah. Are there any plans to have? the NAV update intraday or will our ATM issuance remain dependent on yesterday's NAV? Because, you yeah, know, I mean, no, I was just going to say that considering that spot, uranium tends to move a lot. And, you know, as you mentioned, the market is pretty opaque. Now, basing it on yesterday's NAV might be just a bit tricky. Yeah, I mean, uh, we would love to have intraday value for, for the trust. We do, for other uh, precious metals trusts, we provide an intraday value every 15 seconds. Uh, and that's just because those markets are so liquid and active that that you can you can you can do that calculation. We're not there yet with uranium. Um, I hope as the market matures and evolves, we may be able to get there. Um, I don't think it'll be perfect, but I think you know it's just baby steps here. And, and I think the 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 market has evolved enormously since we arrived on the scene. The the, the spot market um, prior was notorious for being uh, suspect. Uh, a lot of uh, you know transactions were were really just brokers passing pounds back and forth. Um, we've seen the spot market improve a lot in terms of uh, the transparency, the price discovery. Uh, we're we're not seeing we're not seeing as many games kind of being played by some participants. So we we think uh, it's slowly evolving and improving. Got it. You know, moving on. Um, you know, we're, we're moving on away from, you know, this broad uranium shows and just the general uranium market, you know, what would be the impact of Russia sanctioning uranium versus the U.S. sanctioning uranium, you know, to the global supply of enriched uranium? And, you know, would there be different consequences if Russia bans versus if the U.S. bans? Yeah, I mean, there's three different scenarios that could play out. Um, you, the U.S. and other countries could, could uh, ban um, individual utilities can self-sanction. Now, we've already seen examples of that in the U.S. where uh, 
certain utilities have said we're not taking delivery of Russian enriched uranium. And then the third scenario uh, would be Russia uh, basically withholding it uh, as a punitive countermeasure to the West. Um, so any of those scenarios could play out and, and it's impossible to know. Um, but, you know, any combination uh, definitely pressures the marketplace because um, utilities plan years in advance to find the fuel they need for these reactors. And these reactors don't turn off unless they're being refueled. So anything that could jeopardize not uranium and U308, but further down the, the fuel cycle, whether that's UF6 or enriched uranium, that has a greater impact uh, around that you know, operability of, of these nuclear power plants. So uh, that there is capacity in the system to make up that Russian shortfall, but it, it's it's not like there's a, a you know an inventory ready to go. They would have to basically ramp up operations, and um, it would lead to basically more uranium eventually being used by these facilities. So it will put pressure on the market. Obviously, it'll it'll start uh, a, uh, at different points in the in the fuel cycle, but it will create net new demand for U308, which is kind of the building block element. Um, and that's right now what, what people are, are trying to figure out is, you know, how, how the supply chain will get impacted if there are any of these scenarios that play out in terms of uh, enriched Russian material. Yeah, got it, got it. And, and you know, so seeing on a topic for, for a second, um, what are the consequences to all international buyers of Russian enriched uranium if Rosatom is sanctioned. And, you know, for anyone listening, Rosatom is the uh, Russian state, um, state-owned nuclear company. So, um, so, so what would be the consequences if Rosatom was to be sanctioned? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's somewhere between, depending on the utility and the region of the world, you know, somewhere between 15 to 20% of enriched uranium is coming from Russia. So, that would be the shortfall that everyone would be scrambling around to try to backfill. Uh, and that, that scenario uh, would take time to sort out. Um, and it would, it would, it would put uh, pressure on the Western facilities to ramp up their production. Uh, but in the process of doing that, we believe that they would, those facilities would would basically turn from net suppliers of U308 to net buyers of U308, which is one of the reasons why the price of uranium popped about $5 a pound when talk of the sanctions first came into the market a few weeks ago. So um, anyway, the fuel chain is all linked together, obviously. Um, and, and the prices, I would say, has already popped about $5 on, on that potential scenario playing out. And are there, um, you know, as you, talk, as you mentioned, the, the fuel supply chain, um, you know, are there any risks to the fuel supply chain or the uranium market in general that, you know, that you see as potentially likely that most of the market isn't actually thinking about? Yeah, um, I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the thing about uranium is it's the most regulated substance or thing in the world uh, for obvious reasons. So every single pound that comes out of the ground is tracked. Um, so the, the mark, you know, you can, you can basically delineate the market very well in terms of, you know, global demand, global supply. Um, and I, I really, you know, it's impossible to forecast how, how this may all play out. Um, you know, anything can happen. This is the thing about wars is that wars, per, per, uh, create so many different scenarios and so much uncertainty that it's just impossible to model in the forecast. And this uncertainty is what market is. markets like order, uncertainty, and clear paths to different scenarios. Um, and this this war is obviously completely upset that dynamic right now. Um, you know whether that's in 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 food commodities, whether that's natural gas, oil, nickel, palladium, uranium. All of these things are getting impacted right now by all of this uncertainty. Yeah, I think that Russia is a big producer of a lot of commodities, you know, it's almost obvious that, that that would be a risk. And, you know, moving on from uranium, you know, what are your thoughts on the recent LME 
um, nickel incident and, you know, has that created conditions under which I know that sort of incident could be repeated and hurt traders, investors, et cetera, and other markets like gold, silver, other metals, you know, similar to that or similar to what happened with nickel. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, I think, I think the, what, what we've learned the last couple of years is just about anything can happen. These things can kind of, you know, kind of come out of left field. Um, you know, the whole situation with nickel was, it was very troubling for a lot of market participants looking in and, and, you know, I read an article this morning saying that the, the open interest in the LME nickel market is, has really collapsed as certain parties have basically lost faith in that, in that, uh, marketplace. So, but I, it does speak to the fact that a lot of these commodities, um, are in tight supply. And that when certain parties are betting against commodities like this particular uh, entity from China was doing in terms of hedging their hedging production, um, it doesn't take much to break a market. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see more markets break. Obviously, the smaller the market um, makes them more prone uh, versus some of the really big liquid markets. But look, I mean, when oil, when the oil futures contract back in uh, early 2020 actually traded with a negative value uh that to me was a sign that just about anything can happen in the world these days because you know somebody you having to pay somebody to take your oil um you know like who who would have ever predicted something like that so yeah we've seen a bunch of markets in the short term become dislocated uh we saw it happen in the precious metals markets right after covid when when a lot of the shipping and logistics for, for uh, precious metals was just disrupted. We, we couldn't, it was very difficult to move gold and silver around the world with, uh, with COVID in the early stages. So, you know, when you're dealing with physical things, um, there's a whole lot of things can happen in terms of shipping, logistics, uh, production, uh, sanctions, you know, there's just heightened risks um, generally. Mm, yeah. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. And um, I don't know when you speak about the energy transition, you know, you sort of have a dichotomy between what's going on in Europe. So Europe is one directly uh, directly affected by Russia, Ukraine, and you know, uh, and on a similar note, you know, the the, the price rises in gas, etc. In 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 Europe has actually been far more exponential compared to the U.S. and say Canada. And so, do you think there's going to be a different? Do you, do you think there's going to be a different pace when it comes to energy transition, do you think there are going to be additional catalysts that are need, that are needed within the U.S. and Canada in order to, you know, accelerate the transition to, to nuclear? Yeah, well, you know, even before anything happened in the Ukraine, there were all kinds of speed bumps happening with the transition. And, I, and I, what I mean by that is specifically whether it was in Europe, continental, uh, sorry, the U.K., continental Europe or the U.S., there are issues with a number of renewables. So whether the wind was not blowing as much as models had predicted or the past, or whether it was not raining as much as, the, as in the past, um, or whether the sun was, wasn't shining as bright, we learned um, whether you were in the UK or Germany or in Texas, that when you have these weather events or weather shifts, that renewables are not as reliable as you think they are. You know, they're in intermittency uh, be because you're, they're, they're dependent on the weather is, is, is critical. And then when you have like a freak, you know, cold snap or a snowstorm in Texas um, and wind turbines are freezing and natural gas wells are freezing, uh, you, you know, at a point when the grid is actually being taxed, um, it really highlighted to, to the world that you just cannot put all your eggs in one basket. And our belief is that uh, the world will continue to build up renewables and it should, but you need to backfill that with a very reliable base load of power. And so you can choose nuclear as the pairing for a lot of these renewables, or you can basically not have nuclear like Germany and fall back on coal and natural gas as your, as your backup plan. And when you fall uh, on that backup plan, um, and there's a supply crunch, you see the prices of these commodities uh, triple or, or, or quadruple in a very short period of time because they're just not readily available. Um, power plants, you know, natural gas power plant 
70 percent of the operating cost is the actual fuel coming you know into the pipeline uh every day when you think about a nuclear power plant it's about five percent of the total operating cost is the is the nuclear fuel so you can have the price of uranium uh increase exponentially in it but it's not going to force your power plant to close down you're going to continue to operate it uh, whether you're buying uranium at 30 bucks or whether you're buying uranium at 80 bucks um so it's a very different dynamic um it's a very different model um and i think you know our position has been that nuclear provides the most reliable baseload of power that complements the intermittency or or you know mitigates the risk of inter intermittency from from uh, wind solar and, and hydroelectric yeah and, and and it also, and you know, speaking on that topic, you know, what new technologies in nuclear reactors, say like terra power, you know, reduce input uranium per kilowatt hour and lower demand, or is that you know less marginal than overall increase in nuclear power plants? Yeah, well, there's there's a few things that I think are really interesting on the demand side. I mean, you have places like China that have signaled they're going to build another you know 150 reactors, um, so there's going to be a huge build out there. Um, there's going to be existing power plants around the world. They're going to get operating life extensions because we need their we need the reliability of their power. And then the other factor that I find really interesting is the development of small modular reactors or micro reactors. You know, these the, the big knock against these big power plants is take a long time to build and permit, and they tend to run over budget and over timeline. Um, and they're, but they're also not versatile, meaning they work really well for a big city like Toronto, where I live, because you have a huge metropolis. But if you're in a smaller town or a smaller city, you may not need that kind of capacity. So these small modular reactors, I think, are, are much more versatile for, for smaller areas. But what I think is really interesting about the SMRs is their potential to replace a whole bunch of coal-powered uh, plants right now. And these power plants are generally in the Western US, um, but do not have a lot of nuclear power plants, uh, more sparsely uh, populated. And a lot of these communities <clears throat> rely on their coal power plants for jobs and, 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 and local communities. And so if you're gonna close down a coal power, a coal power, power plant, uh, what are you gonna do? Like you're gonna like fire everybody? You know, these communities lose all of their employment base. And then the town goes into basically uh, decay, right? So this idea of taking an existing site, which in many cases has been there for decades, taking some of that infrastructure and repurposing it from coal to SMR is what companies um, are basically piloting right now. And Wyoming, the state of Wyoming, I think is kind of at the forefront here in terms of this pilot project to see if they can turn a coal plant into a SMR over the next few years. And I think it's going to be a really interesting case study because the reality is, is there's thousands of coal power uh, plants around the world that could be repurposed over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, and, you know, on the topic of coal, you know, is there ever, is there ever a situation where we can completely get rid of fossil fuels? Because I guess the obvious answer is no, but, you know, are there, you know, have you ever, you know, have a, are there any scenarios in which, you know, uranium and other green energy take over and we completely get rid of fossil fuels? You know, or did well, you, we would, that would eventually happen? Well, not anytime soon. We just, we just don't have the technology. Um, you know, things like coal, coal is uh, a huge part of the global energy production. But, um, even in, even in the United States, coal still represents a pretty meaningful amount of energy production but places like india and china are still hugely dependent on coal because it's cheap and it's plentiful uh, eventually we'll find some we'll find new technologies like hydrogen that replace fossil fuels but we're a long ways off from from mass you know large-scale commercial applications of that but in the meantime the world's obviously been building out a ton of renewables um, countries like china are, are trying to bring coal production down in the mix uh, in favor of nuclear. Um, China's made a lot of progress on that on that front. I mean, over 75% of all electricity in China at one point was produced from coal. That number is down to just over 50%. And they want that number to keep going down as they build up more, more uh, renewables and, and more nuclear power plants. But 
you know, the transition is doesn't happen in years, it happens in decades. It's 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 a massive infrastructure build. These are big scale projects with big, big budgets. And they, you know, people need to realize that our current energy system, our current energy infrastructure model, uh, which is largely based on fossil fuels, has been built out over the last what 120 odd years. So you just can't, you know, move away from it overnight. Uh, whether you want to or not, and, and move to new technologies, it's it's going to be a multi-decade transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and to wrap up the podcast, um, are there are there any plans to have a Sprout uranium listing on the NYSE or the Nasdaq? Yeah, so we're we've been working with the New York Stock Exchange for a number of months now on on uh, uh, making an. Uh, uh, a listing application to the SEC, and we're very close to making that submission. Um, it will be a novel listing because uh, no one has ever brought a physical uranium market to the uh, US regulator before. So it's going to be an educational journey, no doubt, uh, but we're very committed to doing this. Um, and Sprott is actually paying the legal bill related to this initiative. So we're, uh, we'll, we're, we're looking forward to reporting back on, on our progress in the next few months. John, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You know, do, do you have any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Well, I just want to I just want to uh, applaud you for being a young person and uh, being very interested and passionate about capital markets and helping people uh, educate themselves. Um, you know, by talking to different different people in the industry. So, so you know, kudos to you. Uh, I wish I had thought of something like this when I was your age. Thank you so much. That means a lot coming from you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on. Thanks for having me.